Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's Curlin Lecture. I'm Jason Zarneski, Curlin Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law and Associate Dean of Environmental Law Programs and Strategic Initiatives here at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law. I'm thrilled uh, to welcome you all in person uh, to this 2023 Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law. Of course, we will uh, introduce our distinguished speaker in a few moments, um, but I wanna thank all of you for attending and our speaker for traveling here today. Uh, before we begin today's lecture, there are a number of people I would like to thank. Our Environmental Law Program Manager, Lorraine Rubich. Our Environmental Law Fellows, uh, Gabby Mikkel and Barbara Ballin. Uh, our Program Coordinator, Annie Olson. Uh, the Assistant Dean for External Affairs, Rachel Silva, our Manager in Marketing of, of Marketing and Communications, Renee Brown Chang, and our Associate Director of Environmental Law Programs, Achinthi Vathanagay. I also. I would also uh, like to thank our the the people who you generally don't see but make this place run, our entire IT cleaning and catering teams, uh, without whom any of these events would not be possible. So please, a round of applause for them. Before we introduce today's speaker, uh, a few announcements. Uh, if time allows, we will have a brief uh, Q&A uh, session after the, our presenter. Um, and please, of course, follow us on social media at Pace. Enviro Law or at Haub Enviro Law. And without further ado, I will pass the podium on to our Dean, Horace Anderson. Thank you, Jason. And hello, everyone. We do this every time. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Horace Anderson. I'm the Dean of the Elizabeth Haub School of Law at Pace University. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be able to kick off this year's Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law. Uh, we're pleased to have Professor Sam Kalin with us today to deliver the lecture. Uh, he is the William T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law and Associate Dean at the University of Wyoming College of Law as well as the founder and co-director of the school's Center for Law and Energy Resources in the Rockies. He's currently the visiting McKinney Family Chair in Environmental Law at Indiana University, Robert H. McKinney School of Law, and he will speak today on the United States Supreme Court's approach to, to the, the administrative state and the implications for environmental law, environmental programs, and the environmental movement. The Elizabeth Haub School of Law established the Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law more than 20 years ago to expand its programs of research, education, professional and scholarly activity, and publications in environmental law, a field for which the law school has received, as I'm sure you know, national and international recognition. We are consistently honored to host top scholars, dignitaries, attorneys, experts, and leaders in the public service, such as Professor Kalin, to speak to our community about current environmental challenges and, importantly, solutions to those challenges. This knowledge is fundamental to our understanding of how we apply the rule of law to impact not just us as individual humans, but also our planet. The Curlin Endowment, funds not just this lecture, but also a named professorship on environmental law. Professor Nicholas Robinson, founder of our environmental programs, was named the first Curlin Chair, and Professor Jason Zarneski was designated the second Curlin Distinguished Professor in 2013. So I think I mentioned national and international recognition. There is a particular publication that puts out a, a ranking, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so you know that this is not just a great environmental law program, but the number one ranked environmental law program in the nation. 
And there's good reason for that. Um, this is not just because we have world-class faculty, which we do, um, not just because we have a global network of distinguished alumni, which we do. Um, it's not only because we attract the best and the brightest uh, law students, um, which we do. Uh, it's also because we are constantly innovating when it comes to our curriculum and programs. Uh, and our faculty, staff, and students uh, provide visionary leadership when it comes to thinking about um, environmental, again, not just problems, but solutions. You can read about the problems in the news every day. Here we are about developing the solutions. So now I'm going to turn the podium uh, back over to one of those visionary leaders, Professor Jason Zarneski, who will formally introduce our distinguished Curlin lecturer, Professor Zarneski. Thank you, Dean Anderson. Uh, so normally we have a uh, formal introduction by one of my colleagues, uh, but Sam is a very good friend, so mine will be a little bit more personal and informal. Uh, first, I'd like to thank him in particular uh, for speaking about this topic. Uh, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court is changing dramatically, and so it is very important for us to understand what's going on. So, Sam, I, I thank you for that. I also want you all to know that that Sam, uh, Professor Kalin did practice environmental law in D.C. He also served in the solicitor's office of the Department of Interior uh, during the Clinton administration. Um, and then finally, if I can, uh, I had the wonderful experience of teaching uh, natural resources law as a field course with Professor Kalin in Grand Teton uh, National Park uh, the year before the pandemic. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to revisit that again. Uh, these are unfiltered shots. And of course, you can see uh, Sam on the right teaching uh, the, the class. Uh, on the left are uh, Sam and I, as well as a professor from the Howard School for the Environment at the University of Wyoming. Uh, so, Sam, I'm delighted that, that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I also uh, have the honor of presenting the 2023 Gar Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture Award to Sam Kalin. Uh, the medal, which you see on the screen above, displays a topographical depiction of Storm King Mountain, paying homage to the landmark Second Circuit case of Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference versus Federal Power Commission, a ruling that inaugurated what we today call environmental law. The topographical rendering of Storm King also serves as the logo or brand mark, which is more correct, of the Pace Haub environmental law uh, program. Uh, the award now bears Professor Kalin's name on the back, and I invite him to come up here and accept his award. Um, so I will now invite Professor Kalin to turn on his lapel microphone and deliver the 2023 Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Lecture on Environmental Law. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you. And I should say at the outset, I would have liked the opportunity to like to filter one of those pictures because he, he's a lot more photogenic, I think, than I am. Um, and I, if I had known, you know, I would have liked to like pick out which picture um, that was used. But anyway, I want to thank uh, everyone for being here. Uh, I always enjoy coming to your beautiful campus, and I appreciate being invited to the law school and allowing me the opportunity to talk today about the Supreme Court's approach toward the administrative state and implications for environmental programs. Hopefully, I'm going to say something that's either provocative or troubling, at least enough to provoke some questions at the end. And so yesterday, the court's term just started, so it's only fitting for us to begin once again to have conversations about the court and particularly for our purposes, the court and its approach toward deciding cases and how those uh, cases might implicate environmental programs moving forward. And, you know, just this weekend, we saw one of the news reports with the title Trump's War on Federal Agencies. And in the text, noting how the conservative majority Supreme Court 
already has three cases on its docket that seek to curb the power of federal agencies as its new term begins on Monday. Of course, I'd like to get up here and just talk about two cases. I'd like to talk about West Virginia against the Environmental Protection Agency. I'd also like to even more talk about Sackett against the Environmental Protection Agency, but I really can't. Anyone who knows me might say it's because I'm long-winded. Yeah, that's quite possibly true. Um, or they might say it's because I can't stay focused. I'm pretty sure that is true. Um, the truth, though, is at least what I tell myself the truth is, is that I like to examine cases in context. So we'll get to see what I see is the looming importance of cases like Sackett, as well as one of the most significant cases currently pending before the Supreme Court. And that's, as we all know, the Loper Bright case. But we won't get to that for a few minutes. Consequently, when I'm here and what I'm going to try to cover today, um, and I should say at the outset, I like to warn my students in advance about difficult subjects. And in that vein, I want to warn you that some of what I may say could be considered depressing for those who cherish our environmental programs. And for those folks, you can just write me off and just say, Sam's just a pessimist. I think my wife says that sometimes. Uh, to be sure, optimists in the room might say, well, but the court decided in 2021 that the, in the climate change removal case of BP against Baltimore to allow those cases to remain in state courts. And by the way, it just recently this year denied cert petitions in a number of cases where the parties were trying to get the court to revisit that decision. Um, and yes, in the area of Native American law, with Justice Gorsuch able to secure enough votes, the court has been friendlier to acknowledging Native American rights than in prior years. So in 2019, it issued an opinion from my home state, um, a case called Herrera, where it, up, uh, where it determined that the Native American tribes uh, had certain hunting rates on public lands. And then in that same year, an opinion by Justice Gorsuch once again in what's called the Cougar Den case uh, affirmed the preemptive effect of a treaty on a state fuel tax by a tribal corporation for sales to tribal members. And in June of this year, it upheld the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act um, in a case called Halen against Bracken. And it did similarly rule quite decisively in favor of tribal nations in 2022 in the McGirt case against Oklahoma, holding that a sizable portion of Oklahoma was reserved for the Creek Nation and as such constituted Indian country. Okay, some might respond that part of what uh, it did in McGirt, it took away in 2022 in the Oklahoma against Castor Herrera when it concluded that the federal government and the states have authority to prosecute non-Indians for crimes committed against Indians in that Indian country, ignoring perhaps uh, a good deal of both history and the language of the statute of play. And well, the court in 2019 also ruled in a case called Nick against Township of Scott that a plaintiff need not first exhaust their state court remedies before bringing a case in the federal system, perhaps then making it easier to bring federal cases against state environmentally related actions that arguably could impact private property rights. And as you may have seen, the Supreme Court also accepted cert in a case recently out of Texas, where the court in following up on the next case is going to have to address whether or not the a takings claim is, quote unquote, self-executing. And if they conclude it's self-executing, along with the Nick case, we're going to see even more potential private property claims uh, uh, moving through the system. And also in that same year, back in 2019, uh, while it retained what we call our deference, deferring to an agency's interpretation of an ambiguous regulation, it cabin our deference uh, in a case called Kisser against Wilkie, as all students who have taken administrative law know. So the one case, though, from this past term, and that's Sackett against EPA, is possibly one of the most momentous environmental law opinions issued by the court, narrowing the scope of the Clean Water Act. After all, Professor Carl Yaffe wrote in an article that was just recently published this week, and the title of his article was Sackett and the Unraveling of Federal Environmental Law. So now you can see why I really want to talk about the Sackett case. After all, 
By narrowing the scope of the Clean Water Act, it also reduces possibly when the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marines Fishery Service would be able to review an action to make sure that it doesn't jeopardize the continued existence of an endangered or threatened species or result in adverse modification or destruction of critical habitat. It reduces when state historical preservation officers might be consulted and it shrinks the applicability of any accompanying environmental program triggered when there is a federal license permit or other federally or federal activity. Notably, as the administration just released its recent regulation on the applicability of the Clean Water Act Section 401 program, it similarly diminishes when that provision will apply. It moreover fosters a certain flavor of federalism by forcing those states so inclined to fill the proverbial gap left by diminishing what wetlands would be protected at the federal level. None of that is what I'm here to talk about. Instead, Sackett does something else, something much more subtle. It illustrates the court's approach toward the administrative state and suggests a greater involvement by the judiciary in shifting more power to the courts when interpreting statutory and for our purposes, environmental statutory programs. So let's take a look um, at both the forces and factors that have begun to illustrate the court's uh, effective, uh, I would say, I don't want animosity or something close to animosity toward the administrative state. And then at the end, we can talk about Sackett as reflective of how that might affect environmental programs. So at the outset, it's worth stating the obvious that our environmental programs function as a consequence of how moderate environment, modern administrative state operates, um, with agencies hopefully enjoying enough flexibility to address new and changing environmental threats, problems, and concerns. This means that Congress must often legislate with broadly worded language to ensure that agencies can act when necessary and not necessarily rely on Congress each time something new surfaces. So let's take a brief look at some of the critical areas where I believe the court has employed methods to chip away at the modern administrative state, where it's being asked to chip away, and how all this seemingly surfaced in Sackett. For my purposes, I want to identify three types of cases that you can see up on the screen. And the first one involves agency structure over there. And it addresses uh, the ability of agencies to be basically operate in their historic way. The next area or the next box up there involves cases directly cabining agency authority. And the final one, the more subtle one, the one on the bottom is the one that's possibly more problematic and the one that I really want to spend some time on, and it involves the malleability of modern statutory construction. And the last two of those, both this one and this one, are really what Sackett was all about. So just to quickly look at structure to get that out of the way, the court is taking a look at one case uh, in this current term called SEC against Jarkasi, where it's being asked to rule on a number of questions involving the SEC, including whether the Seventh Amendment applies to a civil administrative penalty proceeding if the type of proceeding might be similar to suits at common law. It's well also being asked to question whether the SEC can initiate an administrative rather than a civil proceeding and whether doing so violates the non-delegation doctrine. And for those who have to worry about removal of power under the Constitution, it also has a question about what we call double removal and whether that's constitutional. The Solicitor General argued how the case involved the administration of public rights not relevant to a Seventh Amendment inquiry. And while the government noted that the court does not fully distinguish between public and private rights, at its minimum, it should allow Congress the ability to create regulatory obligations and provide sanctions in an administrative form for enforcing them. As one law firm commented when noting the court's grant of cert in the Jarkissi case, Quote, the court's decision on these questions may significantly alter and further limit the scope of administrative proceedings in many other governmental agencies, end quote. Professor Erwin Chemerinsky, one of the nation's top constitutional scholars, 
just a few days ago observed how if the court agrees with the Fifth Circuit's lower court opinion in the Jarkissi case, quote, countless federal agencies will be greatly hindered in their ability to enforce the law, adding it will be the most dramatic limit on federal agency power since the 1930s. There's another case as well that's up, I think it's today, and it involves the constitutionality of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. There, the court's being asked to review whether the funding mechanism of the agency violates Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution. That's our appropriations clause because the Bureau gets its funding from the Federal Reserve and it collects fees from non-member banks. This, according to the payday lending industry, circumvents the Constitution's mandate that no money can be paid out of the Treasury unless it has been appropriated by Congress. The Bureau, in arguing in favor of its regulatory structure, not only says it comports with a clause because Congress directed that the Bureau could spend up to a specified amount, it also says that any adverse ruling, and I quote, could call into question the validity of countless appropriations. Okay, so now we can move on to the next category. The court's willingness to allow agencies, whether the Environmental Protection Agency, or maybe the Fish and Wildlife Service, or the National Marines Fishery Service, or some other federal agency, the flexibility necessary to implement their statutory authority. Just how much deference should they be able to get? Um, we all know what happened in our deference which I just mentioned a bit ago, and the, what the court was being asked to do in that case several years ago was to basically shut down our deference, to overrule affording agencies deference when they're interpreting ambiguous regulations. The court declined to do that, but it did cabin its authority or cabin, uh, I would say, uh, our deference, uh, building off a case called Smith Klein. But in doing so, it's important to keep in the back of our mind is what the court emphasized in that context was that uh, courts, when they're reviewing whether to give agencies deference or not, they're supposed to use all the traditional tools of statutory construction first to determine whether or not a regulation is ambiguous or not before it can even begin to have any conversation about giving the agency deference. And that's going to be important as we see toward the end of my talk today. Um, and really, when we also talk about the other form of deference, and that is when an agency obviously interprets a statute. So one of the most cited Supreme Court cases, and I'm sure that everyone here has heard about it and read it maybe, um, and it's one that provides a guide for many lower court judges reviewing agency statutory interpretations, and that is, as we all know, the NRDC against the Chevron case from 1984. Um, it involved an interpretation of the Clean Air Act as well as agency flexibility, because don't forget, it was a change in interpretation of source between the Carter administration and, regular, uh, and the Reagan administration about the possibility of using a bubble when interpreting the Clean Air Act. So as everyone here also knows, Chevron announced its well-known now two-step analysis about when a court confronts an agency's interpretation of a statute, assuming first that the agency charged with administering the statute uh, has that authority and it's announced that interpretation through a process that is sufficiently formal that it reflects the agency's actual and deliberate interpretation. The first step requires asking whether Congress has spoken directly or precisely to the issue or otherwise left a gap um, and through that gap uh, had ambiguous language that then can be interpreted by an agency. I like to say here that the question is whether the, um, whether after examining all the traditional tools of statutory construction, as the court noted, that a judge still believes that the language is ambiguous and that it warrants moving on to step two. And then in that next step is where we talk about deference and whether or not the agency's interpretation is either permissible or reasonable. And we see courts using different terms. Uh, there's a difference arguably between reasonable and permissible, but we don't have time to go into that. Um, so decades later though, the court began to have a number of cases that really put Chevron uh, in a bullseye. Um, and people began to talk about that it had a target on its back with some justice concern that it afforded federal agencies too much interpretive power. We saw this surface for some of you who've seen this in the city of Arlington against the FCC case. Uh, 
where the question was whether or not we ought to give agencies deference when they're interpreting a statutory provision that affects the agency's jurisdiction. Now, Justice Scalia defended Chevron, but other than Justice Scalia, take a look at what Chief Justice Roberts, joined by Justices Kennedy and Leto, had to say. You can read some of that in the first paragraph, but think about the second paragraph. When talking about deference, what they were saying is it would be a bit too much to describe the result as the very definition of tyranny, but the danger posed by the growing power of the administrative state cannot be diminished. So if you take a look and think about that kind of language, that really does suggest the beginning of this, I would say, um, attack on Chevron with a great deal of vibrancy. And a couple of things happened since then. You obviously had Justice Kennedy leave the court, but you also had Justice Thomas beginning to illustrate his views that he regretted signing off on a case called Brand X. And in a dissent to a denial of cert in, in a case called Baldwin, Justice Thomas indicated that he regretted his opinion in Brand X because Brand X was premised on Chevron and he no longer finds Chevron to be an acceptable doctrine. We also know that when Justice Gorsuch ascended the bench, Justice Gorsuch, when he was then on the 10th Circuit, had issued an opinion where he questioned the efficacy of Chevron and indicated that Chevron, if it were shuttered, would probably do very little because the Administrative Procedure Act would take its place. So there have been other, though, I would say, inroads into Chevron deference. Um, when the court, even though it had earlier cases uh, that are similar, it began to avoid Chevron. And it did so most dramatically when it decided the King against Burwell case, as you guys all know, the Affordable Care Act case, and it pronounced how it would not give the IRS deference when interpreting programs primarily administered by another agency when the matter involved the question of deep economic and political significance. That takes us then to at least one of the cases that I said I wanted to talk about right up front, and that's the West Virginia against the EPA case. The case involved whether the Obama administration's clean power plan that relied on an outside the fence reductions constitutes what we call the best system of emissions reductions adequately demonstrated under the Clean Air Act Section 111D. The court began its analysis, and I'm going to quote because it's kind of important to understand the language. It said it's a fundamental canon of statutory construction that the words of a statute must be read in their context with a view to their place in the overall statutory scheme. And then it goes on, and I, uh, it's worth reading a lot of the opinion, but it goes on and then it says, thus in certain extraordinary cases, both separation of powers, principles, and practical understanding of legislative intent make us reluctant to read into ambiguous statutory text the delegation claim to be lurking there. It's worth pausing for a second to highlight the court's language and the pejorative use of that word lurking because it said 111D had rarely been used. It referred to the agency finding in a, quote, long extant statute and unheralded power. And then it said, quote, newfound power in the vague language of an ancillary provision of the act, one that was designed to function as a gap filler and had rarely been used in the preceding decades. And that is why it said it warranted caution, taking a look at the agency's interpretation. Of course, it never really examined the history of 111D. The same scenario could surface when new circumstances arise. They may fit little used, it, it, that's even relevant, uh, provisions in other environmental programs. Also, this discounting of 111D arguably mirrors the subsequent analysis in the Sackett case where at the outset, the court described a particular provision in section 404 of the Clean Air Act in, um, as quite in quite landowner friendly terms. If you take a look at how the, uh, the opinion began, it began by questioning the entire operation and impact from a landowner's perspective um, uh, under uh, the 404 program. This is therefore the, oops, I don't know which one's working. This is therefore the major question doctrine. And when it applies, it requires that Congress provide a clear statement or indication that it intends to allow the agency to do what it's doing. 
And this, of course, runs counter against the notion of allowing agencies sufficient flexibility to address new, novel, or urgent challenges under broadly worded or ambiguous language. It's also problematic, though, because we really don't know what's going to suffice for major question. And so you could ask folks, well, what do we mean by something that is really significant economically or something that's politically significant? In the West Virginia case, what the court had to say is that it was restructuring the energy industry. And I quote, it said it was shifting the transfer of generating capacity from existing sources to wind and solar. But as we know, the clean power plan that was at issue in the case was never enforced. It was not going to be enforced uh, when the court ruled. And the energy industry had already shifted without the clean part, uh, power plan. And the targets under the clean power plan had already been surpassed without the clean power plan. So when we talk about a matter of considerable economic significance, it's hard to say that it was even present in the West Virginia case. So I'm going to come back to this in a second, hopefully, and folks should note this for later on. But the court also relies on EPA's practice involving its application of 111D. Even though the government disputed that practice, the court found at least part of its justification was based on agency practice. That's going to be a problem as we move forward if agency practice is going to be the touchstone for what agencies can do in the future, because practice will cabin flexibility and hinder agencies' ability to, uh, to address new threats and new problems. More recently, the 2023 case of Nebraska against uh, Biden uh, did not overtly apply the ma uh, major question doctrine, although Justice Barrett had a detailed concurring opinion going into the justification for the major question doctrine. As you know, this case involved the HEROES Act and uh, whether or not the, uh, the administration could, quote, waive or modify um, particular loan forgiveness program. And the court's statutory analysis there of how it addressed what it meant by the word modify or waive is anything but stellar. The court looks at the word modify. It uses dictionaries, but it actually doesn't even know what year it's going to use the dictionary from. So it looked at dictionaries both at the time and then later on. But it also ignored the statutory structure because it looked at modify separately from wave. And obviously wave can actually impact how you take a look at modify, but it treated modify first independently. Then it went to wave and it basically said, you can't use wave because your practice has been different. So once again, we see the importance of practice creeping in, at least in the Heroes Act case. But it was Justice Barrett in her concurring opinion where what she said is that the major question doctrine is really an aspect, uh, if you will, of what we call a contextual analysis that we'll get to hopefully in a second. Um, so there was a judge who called it the name we cannot say. Um, I'm not sure what would happen, but the major question doctrine arguably only limits agency deference when you have seemingly deep economic or political questions. So now the campaign is against Chevron directly and whether or not we're going to overrule Chevron. That's the question that was posed in the Looper Bright case that will be decided this term. The case involves the National Marines Fishery Service implementation of the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which is primarily designed to prevent overfishing and to provide for a sustainable fishery resource. In administering the program, there are eight regional fishery management councils, and as part of the effort to ensure collection of reliable data, the act authorizes the agency to require that one or more observers be carried on board. And what NIMS did was it effectively charged, and you're allowed to charge uh, uh, the cost to the ship owners of those observers who were going to be on the, on the ship. In the Solicitor General's brief, chronicling the importance of Chevron in the Loper, Loper case, um, they included a good deal of the scholarship and how the scholarship has shown how Chevron has become effective in the words of one scholar of removing politics from judicial decision-making. An amicus brief by the Pacific Legal Foundation argued on the contrary that Chevron's inconsistent with Marbury v. Madison. 
Another group of administrative law scholars aptly chronicled how the APA incorporated longstanding principles of deference. Another group of uh, scholars observed how Chevron already is narrow and that it only applies after you have looked at all the textual clues to determine whether or not particular language is ambiguous or not, and they emphasize that. So it's impossible to delve into too much of the details, and I surely can't go through uh, the roughly 60 amicus briefs and what the parties have said. Um, but one of the, at least some of the issues that they're going to have to wrestle with in deciding what to do with respect to Chevron is how are they going to treat reliance interests and starry decisis? What's going to happen at the lower court level if we shutter Chevron? OK, well, what is what's it going to do to broadly worded statutory programs that are out there? And there are many. OK, how is it going to impact uh, how legislators draft language? Chevron has been around since the mid 80s. And, and at least those in Congress are aware of Chevron. And it's been a backdrop, if you will, of how they legislate and draft. If you take it away, you also lose that aspect um, as a background principle, if you will, for legislative drafting. So as a consequence, it's quite possible, given all that, that the court's going to be reluctant, if you will, to overrule directly Chevron. And in fact, uh, it's worth pointing out that Professor Merrill has a great book out called The Chevron Doctrine, Its Rise and Fall in the Future of the Administrative States, Harvard 2022. But for students, don't worry about not buying the book because he's got the article. He's got an article in 2021 in Duke Law Review um, where he talks about Chevron. And by the way, for those uh, who haven't yet read his article, in his article, he notes that the Chevron step two analysis we've all learned about, it's dicta. It was dicta in Chevron that they actually didn't use the, the Chevron analysis that was a, at least announced in Chevron. Um, but also what Merrill does in commenting on what's going to happen in Looper Bright is he suggests the court will be hard pressed to overturn, if you will, Chevron in part because we don't know what will be what we'll replace it with. OK, um, so now we get into the area that I really would like to focus on. Um, and while Justice Kagan may have famously said several years ago, uh, we're all textualists, that's not really true. We're all contextualists. Every one of the Supreme Court justices always looks at things from a contextual analysis. So contextualism, I argue, is the reigning paradigm. That can be both good and bad. And here's why it could be problematic. Because modern textualism affords judges wide latitude to employ what tools of statutory construction they feel comfortable wielding. And when doing so, it allows them to decide that they have the capacity to interpret otherwise ambiguous language and say it's not legally ambiguous, thus avoiding shifting interpretive power to the agency. Second, contextualism can support reliance on history. Well, that might be a good thing, provided that one actually does history correctly. The problem is, uh, if you take a look at the court's last, uh, let's say, five years of cases where they look at history, most historians would say they've got it wrong. And in Sackett, if we have time, I'm not sure, uh, they clearly didn't even look at the correct history. And they, without any question, they got that history wrong. So what this seemingly means is that a robust form of contextualism allows judges a greater opportunity to conclude that they, rather than an agency, knows what language ought to mean and thus possibly reduce the instances where Chevron deference might otherwise apply. And so when we start to take a look at the importance of statutory construction, I would love to go through a whole bunch of cases to illustrate how the court has an incredible amount of flexibility to basically say the language is not ambiguous and we're going to mean, we think it means X. There's a great case from 2020 called Cow Pasture, and it was one of the uh, pipeline cases. And the question was whether the Forest Service or, if you will, uh, the National Park System or Park Service would be able to issue the right of way um, across the Appalachian Trail. There's little doubt that anyone who looks, I think, at the statutory language it takes away the power from the Forest Service for any, quote, lands in the national park system. Well, all lands are owned, as you guys know, by the United States government. Lands aren't within each agency. So when the 
Congress used the term lands, it either meant administered or it meant managed or it meant jurisdiction. It sure as heck didn't mean any, it couldn't have meant anything else. So when the court looked at the word lands, it basically ignored that and said, well, but we want to look at the common law understanding of easements and property law and all this other kind of stuff. And it came to some odd conclusion that these were not lands on the Appalachian Trail, in part because they weren't an easement or they weren't um, a uh, something like a property interest, which is clearly not related to anything considerably close to what the United States government does with respect to its public lands, because as I said, all lands are owned or titles held by the United States. I could also count or uh, give you an idea about the American Health Association against Becerra case involving Medicare reimbursement rates. There, the court engaged equally in a very strange statutory construction um, analysis. So in short, the proverbial gap where agency deference was surface is closing. It's getting narrower. And the judiciary is marshalling a, a number of unique tools and expanding tools to basically avoid shifting interpretive power over to the agencies. The major question doctrine, which now says that you have to have a clear statement before we're going to allow the agencies to operate in a certain way when there is something that's politically or economically significant, um, that that surfaced obviously as a, uh, a tool right up front, um, just like the tool that we're going to see, hopefully, oh, marginally, um, in the Sackett case. Um, so when we start to take a look at those tools, what I want you to think about is that the court is enamored with history. For those of you in con law, take a look at the National Rifle case. They take a look at history and tradition, okay? And it's history and tradition that's up in another uh, case this term about what they really mean by that. If you take a look at the TransUnion standing case, they focus on history, okay? And I could go on and on, both in the constitutional area as well as in the statutory area, where we have instances where the court's resting its analysis on an aspect of examining history. And the problem is the court doesn't ever, ever actually go into the history of anything that is purporting to do. And in the con law area, uh, we've seen that. We see it also as well um, outside the con law. And as I said, the statutory arena. And it's worth noting, even in this summer, we had a case for those who like uh, either uh, it, it's both criminal and immigration, uh, the U.S. against Hansen case. Okay, So if you take a look at what the court did there, where the question was a prohibition on inducing illegal immigration. And what the court did is it cabined the scope, arguably to avoid a First Amendment and overbreath concern. And it did so by relying on his, the history of where the concept came from. Um, and Justice Barrett, Barrett elevated statutory history as an important understanding um, for the context of the language that she was re, uh, looking at there. So that takes us to the case that I said I finally wanted to talk about, and I have a few minutes uh, to talk about, hopefully, um, and that is the Sackett case. And we all know, or at least some of us know, the Sackett case, which is the one I started with, um, considered whether the Ninth Circuit applied the appropriate test to determine whether Sackett's property contained wetlands as adjacent wetlands regulated under the Clean Water Act. As you can see from this slide, the Sackett's property is quite close. There is absolutely no doubt that the Sackett's property has a connection to Priest Lake. Priest Lake, which you see up there, has been called the crown jewel in Idaho. The Kalispell Creek that you see up there flows into it. There is a ditch along that road. It's very clear, the facts were clear, at least from what everyone that I've read, that you have this connection between the Sackett's property as well as with Priest Lake. You also had a groundwater connection that was uh, that Carl Yaffe talked about between the Sackett property and Priest Lake. Again, this is the crown jewel of Idaho we're talking about, and clearly a property that was connected to that. 
So the two tests that we know that have been vying for what the scope of the Clean Water Act is going to be is going to be first the Justice Scalia um, a plurality test in Rapanos, which is going to be a continuous surface connection, or it's going to be the Justice Kennedy test of a significant nexus. The significant nexus test, it's worth noting, really is a shorthand phrase for what Justice Kennedy said the court had recognized in a case called Riverside against Bayview Home from the mid-1980s, where the court recognized that the hydrological nexus or connection between wetlands and waterways was there. And it would make no sense to not regulate and protect those wetlands because if you were to dump, for example, something in a wetlands, it's gonna make its way uh, to that traditional navigable water. So you needed to be able to protect, if you will, um, those adjacent wetlands. So where the court came out was that it effectively adopted the continuous surface uh, connection test. Um, and it did so by ignoring 45 years, according to others on the bench, consistent agency practice. It shirked the court's past precedent. It ignored the statutory language. Um, and in doing so, the justices interpreted the application of the Clean Water Act to adjacent wetlands as applying only to adjoining rather than to adjacent wetlands as found in the statutory language. Indeed, after the implementation of the 1972 Clean Water Act was found by the court to be too narrow, and the court in 1975 expanded the program's reach to include wetlands adjacent to other navigable waters, Congress amended the act in 1977 to clarify that it would be the federal government rather than the states that would issue Clean Water Act permits for wetlands adjacent to covered waters. And for quite some time, the agencies have interpreted this to include those wetlands that are separated from a covered water only by man-made dikes or barriers, natural rivers, berms, beach, dunes, or the like. But you had five justices, Justice Alito for the majority, Justice Thomas and Gorsuch for the concurrence, effectively ignoring the import of what Congress did in 1977 in the provision called 404G. And we could talk about, for instance, how they ignored not only the relevance of that by saying it was not the operative provision, but they you also had to ignore, if they as they did, the statutory structure of the language. Because if we look at statutory structure, you don't take words in isolation. You take a look at what other aspects of the statute might say. 404G, which talked about adjacent wetlands, was another part of the statute. So it's clearly relevant and important to understanding what's going to be the scope of the Clean Water Act. And as you know, the Clean Water Act defines and is, uh, is triggered by having navigable waters. Navigable waters are defined as waters of the United States. So how did the majority cabin its analysis? Well, it took a look at the definition and said, well, the definition of navigable waters as waters of the United States, it's not limited to quote unquote, what we think are traditional navigable waters, but the concept of navigable waters informs how we take a look at waters of the United States. The difficulty is that when it did that, and I'm about done, don't like give me some like thing, uh, like sign. Uh, when it did, I, I knew he was going to do that. Um, so when it did that, when it tried to take a look at the history of navigable waters, A, that's inappropriate because it really should have been focusing on not navigable waters, but what Congress defined as navigable waters as wars of the United States. But it relied on history. It relied on the history of the concept of navigability. The difficulty is that history is nowhere present in the court's opinion. That history was given to the court in amicus briefs. That history reflects throughout the 1960s that Congress wanted to expand the scope of its program to address a new issue about pollution. It ignores the entire change of language from basically the Federal Power Act in the 19, starting in 1920, amended in 1935, where Congress started to figure out how to define navigable waters. There was a lot of history about the term in statutory language that really surfaced between the early 1900s and particularly in the 1960s, where Congress abandoned the use of the terms like interstate waters or intrastate waters or the use of the term tributary and instead chose an entirely different definition called waters of the United States intending to shift dramatically what it intended to cover. You might disagree with that, but none of that is present in the Sackett case. 
So as a consequence of all that, what Sackett has done is it's basically given the power over to the judiciary to interpret language and not give deference to agencies. And the minute it does that, it cabins agencies' flexibility to move forward in a progressive way. And do I have any time left? It's time for one question. <laughs> one question. I'll I'll be around for more questions. So, yeah. So go with the problem. So sorry, Jacob Hauser. Good to meet you. Um, I said I was pessimistic. Go on. We're here, we're here to go and find the solutions to the problems. So it looks like we're at the the wine of it is that uh, the Supreme Court is finding uh, constructive avenues to make up whatever they want. To what extent could the legislature dictate to the court how it will interpret its own statutes? Could we do that to some extent, or would that require a constitutional I mean, amendment? A good question. I think what I, we have seen people advocate for a rule of construction, like in Congress, that could do that. You could also have, well, I presume, language that's drafted in a way that would be clear to be able to give agencies sort of flexibility. You know, so long as we don't get into the non delegation doctrine we'd be okay. Um, you know, so arguably that would be the, the limit that uh, the drafters would have. Can I get one more what question? Was your I did skip stuff, let's be clear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so essentially what do we do with the last decades of legislation that's been created intentionally broad for it to be interpreted if it can no longer be interpreted uh, do, you, do you want my happy answer do you want my sad answer your honest one <laughs> my honest answer is i think we're in trouble i think right now the courts are outcome driven and so regardless of how the language drafted is drafted what we're seeing is judicial opinions that are doing very strange things from a statutory construction perspective and I wish I could be honest, I, I wish I could say, but they're principled, but I think that it's really difficult for some of us to say that they're principled decisions. I don't want to end on like a depressing note. I mean, you know, can I? One more short question. I'll speak loudly, I don't need the mic. Um, I will, oh, I'll, or I'll take it. I'll end on a potentially positive question. You mentioned that over the past 10 years, we've seen very drastic swings in the executive branch and therefore in agency interpretation and implementation of environmental law. Is it possible that if the court removes Chevron deference, that it could, given the uncertainty of the next executive, lead to overall preservation of environmental policies and procedures through the court's vice through agency interpretation? Yes. It's, it, I mean, the short answer is yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, a few closing notes. Uh, first, uh, for students of my natural resources law class, we will read Sackett uh, in class, so be prepared for that. Uh, the second, we have a reception to follow in the tutor room. Uh, the vast majority of you are graduate students who need free food, so please join us in the tutor room. Um, in terms of some topics you can talk about in the tutor room, um, you can talk about four cases, Sackett, West Virginia versus EPA, Looper Bright, or Chevron. If you don't know what those are, find a friend who does. Uh, or perhaps these four topics, agency deference and flexibility, tools of statutory construction, the major questions doctrine, or canons of statutory construction. They're your cocktail party talking points. Uh, finally, uh, thank you all for coming, and then thank you, Professor Stanford. I mean, I, I had a lot more than I wanted to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Yeah.